My name is Feline, and today I'm going to talk about what happens in your brain if you process source code. But before we're going to talk about the actual topic, I want to sort of take you through my story because sometimes people think if I talk about these topics that I'm a psychologist or a neuroscientist, but I'm actually just a regular computer scientist that sort of got lost in this interesting topic of what happens in your brain when you're programming because I started to teach programming to children. So in 2013, this is a very long time ago, I taught programming to children and these were really small children. So they were 10, 11, 12 year olds. And I thought this is gonna be easy, right? They are 10 year olds. What can they ask me that I don't know? I know everything about programming. So this is gonna be really easy. And I was very, very excited to start to teach them programming. And then what happened in my brain subconsciously is that I started to remember how did I learn programming when I was a kid, right? So when I was about 10, this is me when I was a 10 year old behind my dad's really big computer. How did I learn programming? Well, certainly I didn't have a programming teacher. No one was teaching me programming because when I was 10, I didn't know any adults that knew programming. So what did I have? Well, I had a book, this book to be precise, basic computer games that was allegedly going to teach me programming, but it wasn't the book that said, this is a variable and this is a condition and this is a loop. If you would open programming books in these days, then this is what it would show. This is just printed out basic listings and you could manually copy them into the computer and then you had a program. And at the time I didn't really know any English. So many of the words didn't make any sense to me, but you know, there was no Netflix then, no Steam. So if, if I had nothing to do and if I wanted a game, this is what I needed to do. And many of us, many people that are now like in their forties share this experience of learning programming from books before the internet, learning programming before there were code clubs or programming clubs. So the only thing you could do is just manually copy everything and learn from error messages. So I think as a community, we've sort of been Stockholm syndrome into thinking that the compiler is our friend, right? We think that the compiler is a great teacher but it's just because it was the only teacher we ever had that we think it's a really good teacher. But that was definitely what I was thinking when I started to teach children, right? So I th thought I put the kids behind the computer, they program, if they make a mistake, an error message comes up and the error message will just tell them what to do and then they can continue. This will be easy. So this was my frame of reference when I was teaching those children. I was like, the compiler will figure it out. So let's look at what actually happened. So this is what actually happened. We started to do Python. You know, Python is a friendly programming language that is easy to understand. So at this point, it was still okay. So print, brackets, quotes, okay. Hello, everyone, this works. And then it prints, hello, everyone. So the kids were like, okay, okay, this, I see where this is going. But there are many, many ways in which you can make mistakes, right? This is also a quite reasonable program. So here you, you have the uppercase P in print. Makes sense, right? We teach children that sentences start with an uppercase letter. But then what happens? Doesn't work because name print with uppercase P is not defined. Mm. Mm. Okay, so some kids were already sort of losing their enthusiasm. This error message, even in Dutch, is understandable, but it was still hard for them, but it got worse, right? Here's another one. You just forget a closing bracket. That seems an honest mistake that a smart computer should be able to fix, but no. Syntax error, unexpected EOF while parsing. So this kid is like, teacher, teacher, what is parsing? Like, this, this is not what I wanna talk about in this lesson. Here's another one. This is the correct example program. Everything is perfect. Brackets, quotes, print, not with an uppercase P. But there's a space there. You think it's invisible, right? This, this will be fine. But it is not fine because this is what Python says. Indentation error, unexpected indent. Right, so this kid, lesson one. Teacher, teacher, what is indentation? 
It's like, I don't want to talk about that right now, right? Because that's not what lesson one is about. So you can't constrain this language in a way that you want because everywhere there's terrible error messages are leaking out in English. Well, as much as you can call indentation unexpected indent an English sentence. But for the children in my class that were not native speakers of English, that was this extra boundary. So after a few weeks, they were not having fun. They were not learning things. I was also not having fun because I was like, why is this so hard, right? How is it possible that programming is so hard? I can do this. All of my friends are also programmers. We've learned this. Why is learning to program so very hard? And then I realized that I don't really know anything about learning, right? And I guess this is true for most of us, most of us professional programmers, whether you went through a boot camp or whether you went to a computer science degree in university, no one teaches us anything about learning, which is weird because we also say our profession changes quickly and there's many new things we need to learn, but we don't know anything about learning and we don't know anything about teaching as well. So now I'm in this crossroads in my career, right? So there was research that I was supposed to do uh, because I was working at the, at the university as a researcher. I was supposed to work on programming systems for, for adults, for professional end users, but I was just so grabbed by this question. I was like, no, but I want to figure out how people learn. That's the thing I care about most, because if I figure out how people learn, then I will be able to teach these children in the programming clubs better. Right? So I was really at this moment, I was like, ah, I don't know what to do. Should I do this thing I'm really interested in? Or should I do my actual job that the university is paying me for? I didn't really know. But in the end, I thought this is such an important question. And I'm so interested that I will sort of not do my job for a while um, because I want to focus on this question. So the next part of my talk, I'm going to talk about the things I figured out when I was learning how to learn about how to learn, specifically focus on how to learn programming. Because what do we know about what happens in your brain when you read code? We know some things, but not so much. But the nice thing is that we do know a lot about what happens in your brain when you read other things that aren't programming. So a brief introduction in what happens in your brain. If information comes into your brain, it's firstly stored in your short-term memory. And your short-term memory, we've known this for a very, very long time, since the 1950s, this was discovered by George Miller, is very, very small. Your short-term memory can only hold between five and nine things at the same time. More does not fit. This is interesting, right? That, that your brain is, is so small. It's a bit like an IO buffer. It can briefly store information that comes in, but then if you don't process it, it sort of gets lost. And this might sound very abstract. So we're gonna do a little bit of audience participation. And this is possible both in the room and also online. So I hope everyone will participate. Here's what we're going to do. I will show you a sentence very, very briefly, like half a second. And it's your goal, all of your goals, to remember the sentence that I showed you. No cheating, right? So don't, no pictures with your phone, no screenshotting. You have to use your brain for this exercise. Here we go. It's a brief sentence, three words, and you'll only see it for a very short period of time. Here we go. So that was hard, right? I hope that was really, really hard. This was your brain trying to process something and, and you couldn't basically remember anything. Why, right? Okay, so let me dive a little bit deeper because I think you sort of get where this is going. When information comes into your short-term memory, it stays there for a brief period of time and then it's sort of sent over to your working memory. And you can see your working memory as the, the processor of your brain. That's really doing the thinking and not the remembering. And when your working memory processes information, it collaborates with your long-term memory. 
And I always see your long-term memory as like this angel that's on your shoulder that says, oh, I know these things. Hey, do you look at an A? Then maybe you also want to look at a B. Oh, have you bought this book? Then you also like this book on Amazon. It's very much like this. Your long-term memory is going to offer you information related to the information that you're presented in the working memory. So your long-term memory, the things you already know, help you process new information. And so to drive that point home, we're going to do another memory exercise. It's the same exercise. So a three word sentence that you'll see for just a very brief period of time. And it's your goal to remember it. Here we go. So I guess that was easier because these were things, something was happening in your brain. Your long-term memory angel on your shoulder was like, letters, letters, I know letters. Let me give you all the information about letters. So your brain felt activated, whereas probably in the first sentence, you're just like, I got nothing, right? So we're gonna do one more, just to show you that it is possible for your brain in such a brief period of time to actually remember a three word sentence. It's not so hard if you can use your long-term memory. Here we go. So that was easier, right? Because th these were words, cat loves cake. So it was just this three word sentence that you already know. And this is because you can grab information from your long-term memory. You're, you're not remembering a C and an A and a T. You're not remembering half a circle or a circle with a stripe or a cross. You just immediately process all of the information straight away. You, you, you can immediately see what is there. And this is because that information is retrieved from your long-term memory. Your long-term memory helps you to read something. And actually what someone in the chat is saying for the first sentence that this felt a bit like their first contact with C++. So that is actually true. If you look at a programming language that's very unfamiliar to you, it will also feel like I have no clue what's going on here. So let's apply this theory of the different parts of the brain and how they interact with each other to what happens in your brain if you actually process source code. So there's different forms of confusion that can happen in your brain that are related to those three different areas. For example, if we look at a program in APL, this is a programming language, a very old programming language from the 1960s, that's a bit weird. And I ask you, what does this code do? If you don't know APL, which I guess is true for many people, then the problem lies here, right? This is where the problem is because you don't know what the T is. You recognize the twos and you recognize the ends, but you're like, yeah, I don't know what that thing is. So that's where the problem is. So we call this a long-term memory issue. It's not the matter that you say, I don't understand the program, right? It is just, I don't know the one concept. So this is already something really interesting to explore in programming. Some of you might know that we're going to do these uh, programming reading clubs. And we do this online with Katja, who is actually there live with you. Um, and we try to also build up this vocabulary between the difference between I don't know and I don't understand. So I also used to say, looking at code that I don't, I'm not familiar with, oh, I don't understand anything. But sometimes part of it is that you definitely have the ability to learn, but you just don't know. That's a long-term memory issue. But there's different issues as well. So here's a Python program that if you're a Python programmer, is probably relatively easy for you to understand. But if you're not a Python programmer, if you come maybe from a Java background, then this thing, a list comprehension, it might be many elements for your long-term for your short-term memory. It's like customer names, C dot first name for C in customers. So there's all of these different elements. And if this is not familiar syntax to you, then that may overload your working memory. So depending on your prior knowledge, this can easily be relatively either be relatively easy or can be like 
okay, I sort of see all the individual things, but I don't know how it connects together, much like the second sentence that I showed you where there was letters and you recognized the individual elements, but you didn't have the prior knowledge to connect them together into a concept quickly. So that's a short-term memory issue, potentially based on your prior knowledge. Then here's a third form of confusion that again is a very different form of having difficulties with understanding code. This is a piece of basic program. And then I sort of assume that most of you in the audience will be familiar with the individual elements here, like let and for and return. So you know what the individual lines are. You can read the first line and you're like, okay, so the variable n2 gets the value of the integer version of n and the absolute of that. You can read each line, but then if I ask you at a higher level, but what does this do though? You're like, I, I don't know. I have to like take an example program, let's say n is seven and then trace through it, right? Okay, so n is seven, that means n two becomes three and then b string gets the string one. You have to step through it to figure out what it actually does, even though you recognize and understand and know all the individual elements. So this is a working memory issue. You have all the information, your long-term memory angel is like, here's everything you need to know about this program, and still it is hard. That's a working memory issue. And you see that these different types of programs really do different things to different parts of your brain. And if you don't recognize that, then all of it is like, this is really hard, and that's not so helpful, right? If you're like, okay, this is hard, now what do I do? I don't really have a concrete path forward. But the nice thing is that these different forms of confusions, once you start recognizing them, also really have different solutions. Because if I'm suffering from a long-term memory issue, if I just don't know a thing, I could learn that thing, right? I can practice syntax. And this is something we've been doing extensively in various contexts where we're like, well, if you wanna learn a programming language, you just have to do some work. Right? Just like if you want to learn French or Polish, you just have to have a basic vocabulary. You definitely don't need to know all the words. You can look up something. But if you want to read a Polish newspaper and you don't know any words, looking up every word is going to be really, really tiring and energy consuming. And it's just the same for, for syntax. Sure, you can look up something occasionally, but if you don't have any baseline, reading the thing is going to be really hard. And one way you can actually practice syntax that I talk about in my book as well, is that you can make flashcards, like these little paper cards, and on one side you put French, and on the other side you put Polish. That's like a, a traditional way to use them in language education, but you can also say, well, if I want to learn APL, on the one side I put the APL commands, and on the other side I put the meaning, or you do Java and Python, and that's a way to gain at least some basic level of syntactic familiarity. But the different confusions, right, have really different solutions. So here's the Python program again, where you have a list comprehension. Imagine you're a Java programmer and you individually recognize the elements, but you're like, yes, but what exactly goes on? You could say, well, I will just rewrite this program. Right? I'll just move it closer to my own prior knowledge. This second example here, it does the exact same thing, but it's more a Java way of doing it, right? So it first creates an empty list and then it explicitly loops over the list and gathers all the elements that are being filtered. So rewriting this code in a more familiar form means that for you it's less chunked, right? So you move it from being this letter soup towards actually being organized in words that you can recognize. And this is a concept that I present in my book called a cognitive refactoring. It's not necessarily a refactoring. Some of you, the functional programmers in the audience are like, no, this is worse, right? You're making it longer and less functional. That's definitely not a refactoring because we tend to use the word refactoring for when we're improving source code. But here we're refactoring not necessarily to improve the code base, but we're refactoring to actually help ourselves. And sometimes you might want to commit this refactoring because everyone in your team has a Java background, so you think this is easier for everyone. But sometimes, of course, you just do this locally on your own branch and then you throw it away. It's just to help you understand. It's sort of like 
train your wheels on a bike and then once you understand it, you can just throw it away. So this third type of confusion that we talked about, this basic program where you're like, what is this? That needs help for your working memory. So your working memory is getting really, really full. And that has the same limitation of a only a few things that you can think about at the same time. But there's techniques where you can support your working memory. So you can recognize, hey, my brain is getting really full. And there's people that are doing so super cool research. They're doing biometric measurements of what programmers are experiencing. So they put like sensors on people's head. And then if you frown, they can measure that your code is really tricky. So you can actually measure this by your frown muscles, but you don't even need a device for this. You can also recognize this in yourself or you're staring at a piece of source code. And you're like, what, what, what the fuck is going on here? This is when you have to think, okay, my working memory is full and I can do things to support it. And there are many different things you can do. Just one of the examples is that you can make a little state table that I'm showing here. You can say, okay, I'm just gonna do it step by step. These two lines, what happens here in terms of the variables? Okay, value seven, value seven. Next step, you know, the first iteration of the loop, this is what happens. Next step, this is what happens. And then really slowly you try to figure out what's going on. Then you're helping your working memory to make sense of things. So as I said, I didn't really actually do my job for, well, a year or two, because I was trying to figure out how do people learn anything. And then maybe I went overboard a little bit, because when I learned all those things, I thought, well, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be really nice if other programmers also knew this, right? Because all of you, of course, you can just read an introductory cognitive science book, but why would you, right? And there's so many stuff there that's not even relevant. So I thought, let's take the parts that are super relevant for programmers and contextualize that with programming examples and put it into a book. So that book became The Programmer's Brain, uh, that you can see here, and I have a link also to my book if you want to buy it um, at the end of the talk. And I think there's some sort of raffle that, that they're going to give away a few physical books at the conference, but the organizers will have details about that because I'm not on the ground. I don't know exactly how, how that will work out. So I wrote this book and I figured out many things about learning to program and then I thought, okay, so clearly now my next step is to apply this to programming for children. So, because now I know, I know the problem, right? I understand that the problem with teaching children Python is that it overwhelms their working memory. That there's just too much for them to think about at once and I need to limit the thing that they look at, make it smaller and smaller so that they're just looking at one thing and they can fully focus on one concept without getting really overwhelmed. And that idea turned into the heady programming language that you see here on the screen. So this is a way of teaching children Python that is easier. Here you see print hello and print welcome. That's the thing that actually runs, right? So no brackets, no quotes. We just start really, really simple with the basics. Hey, you type this and then actually code comes out. So you have codes on the left-hand side and you have output on the other side and you can just run it and you don't need this complicated syntax. And as you can see, it also runs entirely in the browser. That's mainly because many schools and programming clubs can't really easily install something. So you just go to the website and then everything is there. You don't need to install anything because you know installing Python for a school teacher is already gonna be quite a big hassle. What you see here is that we're really, really aiming to lower the cognitive load. Another thing I saw with teaching children, and this is maybe also something you re recognize in yourself, is if explanations are elsewhere, like you're programming in your IDE and you look something up on Google, you have to go to the browser and you sort of forget, what am I doing here? Like, what, why, what, what was I looking up? And he has to go back to the IDE. You're like, oh, yeah, that was it. And then you look it up again. And he's like, oh, I need this code snippet. And you copy paste it over, but then you, you forget half again. So switching between contexts is very, very expensive for your brain. And therefore, we incorporate that into Hedy as well, that we have the lesson plan right there in the editor. So you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go to another tab or on the paper sheet on your desk. Everything is just there. And we also have, oops, that took a while. We also have built-in cheat sheets. So you don't have to look up the syntax 
on Google, everything is right there in the editor, just to limit the energy that it will take you. So what we also have is error messages and error messages that are um, reasonable, I would say. It's maybe a little bit more reasonable than Python, right? So instead of saying unexpected EOL, we actually say print is not a Haley level one command. Did you mean print? Right? So we try to vocalize this is the problem and this is maybe the solution in a sentence that you can read. So that's going to be very useful to figure stuff out. What we also have from the beginning is this idea of what is, what is programming for, right? Because I, I told so many children Python and then we print text. And then when I was 10, printing text was really cool, right? But now these kids are like used to super cool graphics. And then what they get on the screen is print hello world. It doesn't really excite them so much. So we want to make it slightly more exciting. So we have an ask command, which is like an input. You can ask someone their name, like Feline, and then it echoes the name back to you. But notice that there's that the state is hidden, right? There's not really a variable that you assign. You can just ask it and it saves it somewhere and repeats it back to you. So just as a comparison, if you want to do something like this in Python, this is what you have to do. You have to explicitly declare the variable and have an input and have brackets there and quotes. You have to remember what is the variable. So we make it so much easier to actually achieve a little bit of input and output. And then the levels slowly get more complicated. So in level two, we add variables explicitly. So now you can have name is Hedy, age is 15, and then you print name is eight years old, and that just outputs it. And now maybe your programmer brain is like, ah, this is weird because name is a variable and the other stuff is a string, but in line three, you just mix variables and strings. <laughs> this is for us, this is weird. But for kids, it doesn't matter at this point because we want to draw their attention to what is a variable and, and we'll deal with the quotes later. So in level four, we're introducing the quotes and then we're explaining them what issues this small language has and what you can do later on. So here, for example, level four, we add quotes, but that's the only thing we add in level four, right? We really pinpoint their attention on all of these little parts of programming, and this goes on and on. So level seven adds repetition, but in a really easy way. So it's like repeat three times, print Hattie is fun. It isn't for I in range brackets, zero comma four. So this goes slowly that we change the syntax until all the way at the end in level 18, then we are actually doing Python. So something that's really cool, I mentioned that my children in my class, the Dutch children, were struggling with programming in English and with English error message is that our system is entirely localized. So you can set your language, for example, to Spanish and then everything becomes Spanish. The explanation, the error message, but also the programming language itself. Uh, we support 30 languages at this point in time, and, and Polish is actually one of them, even though not everything has been translated. But if you want to get started with your child and you want to program in Polish, that is actually possible. And we went a bit further. We don't just support uh, Latin languages. We also support non-Latin languages, including uh, Korean, Japanese, Hindi, Bengali, and Arabic, which is also interesting because as you can see, the whole UI, everything is flipped. We have three right to left languages. Actually, we also have Farsi and Hebrew. So I'm really, really, really trying to lower this stress that programming puts on your brain by taking away all these barriers that I learned about understanding the brain better. So that was sort of it. This is everything I wanted to share. If you want to know more about my work, I'm on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Felina and my website is felina.com. If you're interested in acquiring the book, we talked about so the chapter one and two, but there's so much more that I'm going to talk about in the book. There's this chapter about how to onboard junior developers, which is very much, of course, like teaching. And we also have chapters about reading larger code bases, not just like smaller things, but how do you how do you explain or and understand like the architecture of a system. So if you're interested in checking that out, you can just go to felina.com slash book. And if you want to know more about Hedy, then you can go to felina.com slash Hedy. We are open source. 
and we have many open bug reports. So if you want to like help us close bugs, then you can go to the affiliate.com slash heady, links to the GitHub. And if you want to add more languages, as I said, we have 30 languages, which is a lot, but it's definitely not all of the languages. You can also support Hedy by translating more content into more languages we don't yet support. And with that, I think it's time for Q&A. Yes, thank you very much. Amazing work. For those of you who didn't hear, there was just a round of very nice applause here. Thank you. This is amazing work that you are doing. Uh, we will now try to take questions. Let's first take questions uh, from our o online audience. Let me read it out loud. How young was the youngest student you tried to teach programming using Heidi? Yeah, so the youngest we went is like nine or ten. Uh, we also think that's the recommended age because you do need a bit of language proficiency. It needs to be possible for you to easily read and also type. Uh, but we we get, of course, emails from uh, from parents that say, oh, I did it with my five-year-old and they were having lots of fun. Uh, so it's definitely possible to do it younger. But I think then you're really talking about a context where it's one child with one parent. I wouldn't do it to a school group of five-year-olds. I think that's going to be mayhem. But if you sit next to them and you guide them, then that's definitely possible. And there's like many cool things in Hattie that I didn't talk about. One of the things that we have is that we have also a turtle. So you have this turtle mode where you can draw something with code, like a little square or, or star. And that module also connects to a pen plotter or it connects to an embroidery machine. So you can create something in Turtle and then with one click, you can load it on a pen plotter. And that's definitely something that might engage younger children because then you have this physical aspect of look at the thing we made on the screen. If you have pen plotter, you can buy one or make one yourself for like 100 or 200 euros. It's like, look, this is the physical thing that we're making. So the younger you go, I think the more important it is that you do things that they really like because a five-year-old then you print hello, hello name on the screen. Maybe they're like, yeah, <laughs> okay, I'll go play outside, Dad. This is not for me. Thank you. We will take one more question from online audience, then we will go a round of questions on site. Uh, what happened to the first group of your students? Were you able to change their minds despite their first experience, or are they completely lost to us? That's a lovely question. So it's a, it's a great question as well. So from that first group that I was teaching, we definitely lost some of them where they're like, this is just too hard. I, I don't see a path where I will enjoy this. I don't see where this is going to be fun or valuable to me. So definitely some of them dropped out and some some stuck with it. And also some didn't want to do Python. They just wanted to do it like Scratch or other things that were that were less um, intimidating, but some of them stuck around and in some contexts, actually, some of them started with Python and they did a little bit of Hattie. They tested like the first prototype I built two and a half years ago. So some of them were sort of managed to recapture with some of them. Yeah. yeah. My bad. I destroyed some children for programming. Oops. I tried my best. <laughs> Thank you. We have now a question from our own audience here. Mm -hmm. Tur turned on. Uh, so thank you for the great talk. And my question is, uh, af after the students learn through your tool, do you think they might later on struggle to switch to some more, let's say, real world experience where they suffer uh, from the, all the issues you have mentioned through your talk uh, with those uh, un uh, very often unreadable for beginners, uh, error messages and stuff like that? Yeah, so this is a great question. So we sort of try to get them to Python. So our level 18 is a subset of Python, right? So in a sense, we bring them to Python. But there's many things if they go to actual, actual Python where, where they can still suffer. Error messages is one of them, but also localization is one of them, right? So if you have Chinese or Arabic students going with their own, or, or Polish, with their own natural language keywords to level 18, and then they're going to go to Python, they will have to go to English keywords. So there's really still there some gap there that might be bigger for some people than for other people where, yeah, they will have to consume um, English error messages and have to produce English keywords. But so one of the things I'm hoping with this, like we did this extensive work on localization, six months of my life were like lost to this Arabic version. Um, 
and I'm writing up my experiences on all the things we ran into uh, building that. I'm hoping that if I package that thing, both as maybe a library that is separate from Hedy, um, and also a write-up where I say, this is the challenges that then maybe other language designers, maybe some of you are there, are like, okay, well, it's going to be a lot of work to actually make this work in local keywords and to localize our error messages, but it's going to be worth it. So hopefully some of the things we're doing will better error messages, localized keywords will spill over to grown-up languages because now that I'm used to Dutch error messages in Hedy, I also and keywords, I also want that in Python. Why don't I get error messages in my own native language? Right? And then for me being Dutch or for you being Polish, you know, it's maybe not that bad, but imagine being an Arabic developer and also developing an assist software that's maybe Arabic, right? So all of your plain text strings are Arabic. Software is not so great at layouting right to left and left to right strings in one line. It's gonna be a mess. So yeah, so I hope that some of the work we're doing on accessibility in various ways will also spill over to adult languages and that other people will also adopt this. Hey, you know, it doesn't have to be so painful. You don't have to have this enemy compiler shout in your ears. It can actually be your friend if you just work a little bit harder. Great question. Thank you. We will take now one more from on-site and two from online. All right? Cool. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you for the great talk. Uh, so my question is about the techniques you uh, you mentioned, uh, the flashcards and so on, uh, because you, you kind of never came back to that. So is that applicable in a classroom setting or does do students need to sort of be self-motivated to use them? Or can you, you know, just hand out flashcards to a bunch of children and they will actually use them? Well, so you have to guide it as anything, right? So yeah, it's definitely applicable in a classroom setting. Um, but we shouldn't count on self-motivation. So let me let me zoom into that part, right? Because we shouldn't accept no for an answer. Because if kids aren't motivated to learn language, we don't say, oh, that's fine. You don't read and write, right? Oh, I don't want to do math. That's fine. You just don't count to 20. It's like, <laughs> no, right? I don't care if you're motivated. If you're my computer science class, I want you to learn something. Because if we count on self-motivation, then that's very go likely going to also um, strengthen stereotypes. Because who is going to be really motivated? Yeah, maybe more likely the boy whose dad is like, I'm seeing people in the chat, like they have a nine month old and they're already thinking, how do I get them into programming? Which is great, but so many people don't have those parents, right? So I now teach actually in a high school, so in a, in a little bit more formal setting. And many of my 12 year olds come into high school and they're like in programming class, like, I don't know if I like this. I don't really know what programming is. Or maybe even if they're girls, they're like, I think this is going to be really hard because my brother says it's not for girls. This literally happens. So if I'm like waiting for them to be super motivated and half of them will never get there. So I, I don't, I know this sounds weird, but in a sense, I don't care if you're motivated or not. I just, I want you to learn because like I was never motivated to learn German when I was in high school. I thought this is going to be a waste of my time. I am now in Germany. Turns out it's actually quite useful to know German, right? So it's great if kids are motivated, but if they're not, that doesn't um, exclude my responsibility to still try to teach them something. So some of them enjoy the flashcards and they enjoy teaching and practice. And other ones are like, I just want to like be on the computer and build things. But then I see that they're struggling with syntax. So I'm like, okay, we're going to close the laptop and you're going to do some practice. It's like eat your broccoli, right? I don't care if you like this, you need vitamins. So I guess that's my answer. All right, thank you. Let's take some online questions now. Um, we have one from Adolfo. How does the knowledge in your book help the average programmer? I think it sort of helps every programmer, but maybe even more the average programmer than the expert programmer, whatever that means. Um, because there are these people that easily pick up more programming languages like there exist people that easily pick up natural languages so maybe they need the techniques in my book less right if you're not struggling with learning your fifth programming language like 
great, good for you. Um, so I think that the, the techniques in my book are really like should help you if you are struggling with, for example, switching from Java to Python or from C, C Sharp to Rust or whatever switch you're making, because it deliberately talks about, okay, so if you're struggling with unfamiliar code, if you're struggling with learning a new language, here's some things you can do. So I think, yeah, it's sort of meant for people that are that, that realize that they are struggling with learning anything in the programming space, whether that is new language or getting used to a new framework. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's take another one from online audience. We have uh, one from Daniel. What do you think about Scratch or Snap today? I know you worked with it in the past. Those That's are the a great question. Languages. Yes, I was just going to say, so Scratch and Snap are block-based languages. So instead of typing syntax, you click blocks together. So this is a fantastic question because I love Scratch and I love visual languages and I would like to teach them to children. But here's the problem. In that setting that I just talked about, we also used Scratch. And for 10, 11 year olds, Scratch is fine. But then in the Netherlands, at least we have this cut between elementary school goes until 12 and then high school starts at 12. So when kids age into 12, 13 year olds, when they sort of age into puberty, what they don't want is things that look like toys. What they don't want is stuff that's their little brother or sister's playground. So even though they could still learn a lot about programming from these block-based languages, specifically Snap, Snap has like higher order functions. So you can do a whole functional programming course at the university level using Snap. But kids in the programming club, they started to say, no, 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 we don't want that. This looks like a toy, right? This is not a real programming language. And even though I hate that argument, if I have to give a five minute lecture to a 12 year old, why the thing they're doing is actually authentic, I lost the pedagogical war, right? So it's not about necessarily didactics, about am I able to teach them? But it's about the pedagogical relation, like does this child trust that I know what I'm doing? And that's, it, it really saddens me. And I know there's some initiatives also to make Snap look a little bit more like an actual textual language. And it's one more thing I want to point out. It's not just about that it looks like a toy. It's also about employability. So some kids come into programming because you know they're super excited about programming. And then maybe they don't care so much because you can tell them this is a for loop and this is a condition and it also exists in regular adult languages. And then they sort of believe that and they go on their way. But the school where I teach, the neighborhood where I teach, it's really very much if this means anything to you, an, an inner city neighborhood. So it's a very poor area. It's actually one of the poorest zip codes of the country where I live in. Many kids come into programming, my programming class, they don't care about programming. What they want is an employable skill. They come from poverty and they know that programming is a career that can get them out. And that's what they want. And then Scratch, however much I love Scratch, it's very clear that that's not an employable skill, that that is not going to pay the bills. And then you show them Python and, and they know that Python is what, what makes YouTube and Instagram and they understand that that's a moneymaker for them. And that's not traditionally um, an argument we like to make in programming because we sort of kid ourselves into oh, our profession is special. Right? And we, we have this passion for it. But I think we have to come to terms with the fact we also see this in the growing number of undergraduate students across the world. We have to come to terms with the fact that many people will be in our field that they don't care necessarily. They don't love programming. They just love that it's a thing that can make them money. And I will go on the record here to say, I don't even necessarily love programming. I love what programming enables me to do, like build better tools for spreadsheet users that I did earlier in my career and build better tools for children. I don't love programming because it's programming. It's like, I don't love my knitting needles. I love making a sweater. So we have to start thinking about these different perspectives. I think about the tools. It's fine if people love their tools, but it's also fine if people don't love their tools and they just love building and crafting things. Very interesting. Thanks very much. Uh, let's take one more question, online question, and then we will be taking two on-site questions. Uh, what is the main thing that language and tooling creators should change to make their language tool more approachable? Localization. Like, the thing has to be in North English. That's my one answer. 
but like the, as the main thing. There are many things, but this is the thing. Like I did it, and you won't believe how the interaction of people with your tool changes if they can do it in their mother tongue. It's just an experience that so many people forever have lacked to program in their own language. It's mind blowing. Okay, we have a question here. Uh, just press mic, uh, the button at the top. Mm -hmm. One, two, yeah, it works. Well, thank you very much for this inspiring, inspiring talk. Um, as you just said, programming is nothing for girls. What do you think about this ridiculous proportion of the sexes? I think we have 10% female attendance here, and this is very, very good for a computer science conference. I don't have any explanation for this fact. I think uh, computer science is a thing which is, fits very good to girls. Yeah, it's no, no heavy machines. You don't have to climb into, into uh, mud and lift and we have engines. Um, what is your experience with young girls, with young boys, and have you any explanation for this for this obvious effect? Yeah, this is a, a great and also sad question. So when I was younger, when I was a student, um, I was in university and there were 150 freshmen and there were two girls, me and one other girl. And then I thought this problem will fix itself because it's just about choice. Like girls don't really choose this and then we have role models and then everything will be fine. But I'm seeing now that there's, so, now I'm, like all there, nothing has changed. Like I'm in this business for 20 years and nothing has changed. So there, there's lots of dynamics that we really have to fight against um, because it, it's really not about girls. It's about boys and dads. Th this is sadly where the problem lies, right? So in this course that I teach, sometimes there are 12 year old boys that tell girls, why are you here? This isn't even for you. And it's not like they, they magically get these thoughts, right? They hear this at home, they see this in the news, they see this on, on TV. That's really, I think, the problem that we have to solve. So I used to be very much in favor of all of these, oh, let's have girls programming clubs and let's try to get them excited. But then they are excited. We should just stop getting them not excited, right? I mean, we should just stop sort of overt sexism, that is the problem. So if you're running a code club for girls, this is fantastic, but you also have to, if, if someone, and this is a hard conversation, right? If a 12 year old boy is in my classroom saying, hey, this is not for you, I have to speak with them, even though I don't necessarily enjoy having that conversation. And even though I understand this boy is not at fault in itself alone, and that's really the conversation that we should have. And one of the things I do, which I love, is that I, I Google uh, Guido from Rossum. He's the creator of Python. And he went to Python a few years ago with a pink shirt. And on the shirt is Python is for girls. And I just Google that picture and I show it. I'm like, let's ask the creator of Python what he thinks about this. And he show that. So I think that's the type of role modeling we need. I don't want to be your role model i don't have time to be a role model i just want to do my job you all can be a role model you all men like i'm talking to the 90 percent men that are there you can be these role models you have to really radiate that programming is for women and for girls i've been doing this 20 years i'm just sick of it can you all do it for me like that's i think this is really the type of activism that we need from the male leaders in our community like guido that was like when i saw that i was like so so touched that is sadly what we need and if you see people being shit to women in various ways then that's also a point where you can stand up so yeah i don't have a magical solution sadly thank you sounds like a call for action thank you feline next question on site question here yeah hello hello uh, so yeah thank you for the uh, showing the great uh, tools and the ways how to accelerate training programming but uh, what about tracking the progress and grading yeah from one side uh, you know children maybe don't like to be graded especially if they get grades but uh, in the end we also became junior or senior programmers yeah uh, do you grade your uh, younger and older students and what's your approach here 
Ah, that's a great question. So built into Heli, we have actually two grading mechanisms. One of them is we have a multiple choice quiz, which is like a code reading club exercise. So we give them a little Heli snippet and we ask them to predict what does this do? And that's a really good way to measure their understanding. And then it's up to teachers what to do with that. So the teachers can give a grade or a sticker for kids that perform well, um, or they don't. This really depends a bit on your classroom atmosphere. But we really give teachers the opportunity to see how their students are doing. And also, so that you have a little teacher dashboard if you log in, so you can see which kids are struggling, for example, from a high percentage of error messages, but also from having lots of wrong answers in the quiz. And the second thing, in addition to the multiple choice quiz, is we have a technique called Parsons problems. And that's where we give children a programming exercise. But instead of typing the letters, they can rearrange the lines of code until the program works. And there's really cool research that shows that doing this Parsons problem exercise where you rearrange lines is actually as effective as measuring quality as open programming exercises. So those are two things that we do. And you do get like scores and points. And what we also have in the system, we have achievements. And those achievements are not really about like having understood something, but it's just about having done something. So for example, if you submit a program that fails three times in a row, you get this little uh, well done for sticking with it achievement. And you get an achievement for unlocking all of the different levels. So your first turtle program is like, well done, you've tried a turtle. So we really try to encourage like trying out many different things and exploring and, and sticking with it. And then it's up to teachers if they want to use the quizzes and Parsons problems for grading. It really depends if you're in a more traditional school or, or if you're in a more like a Montessori-like school, whether or not you really want to assign grades and numbers to that. We give the freedom to the teachers. Thank you. I have uh, one last question. We have time for one more. Um, cool. Already asked us some, for some help, maybe, with translations uh, of the Hedi. Um, I have another question here. So uh, many countries started to introduce uh, computer science into the national curriculum for, for schools. For example, in Poland, uh, for the last five years, programming was a mandatory subject uh, from grade one. Uh, and, uh, of course, there is a scalability issue here because we do not have as many... Uh, IT computer science teachers in all the schools, and it's not the only Polish uh, specific problem, it's worldwide. Uh, can you offer some advice or let us know if you have met any, any people trying to scale those curriculums, national curriculums, uh, and how? How this is being done? Yes, a great question. So one of the things that we've also explored is to have non-CS teachers teach programming. So we just did an experiment in our school with our English teacher that did some programming in his class. So he teaches English to Dutch kids um, because there's lots of ways in which programming can also support other areas. So what they do in English class is they have to write an, a story and then instead of writing it on paper, they actually do it in a programming language where it, it can be just a little bit more fancy because you can have choice, you can have repetition, you can have interaction. So I think we have to unlock the power of many other teachers. Um, and if you have a system that's not so hard to use, then it's actually quite possible. So we get many elementary school teachers who also aren't IT professionals, right? So they teach all the courses. They have one group and they teach all of that. We have many elementary school teachers using Hedy because compared to Python, it's at least a lot more reasonable that if you're a non-expert, you can teach with it. Because if an error message appears, you, you can understand it and the kids can understand it. Whereas you can imagine an elementary school teacher debugging unexpected EOL, right? You need so much knowledge for that. So I think one of the ways to scale this is to build systems. Uh, the Scratch and Snap are also ways to build that, where at least you don't have syntax errors. We need to build systems that give teachers the confidence, hey, this is the thing I can use. This is something I, I think I can help my students learn. Uh, rather than giving them tools that are for professionals that are too complicated. So those are like two answers. Better systems that make it more reasonable to teach without a lot of prior knowledge and also enabling um, English teachers, art teachers, right? We do art work with the turtle and then on an embroidery machine. You can also do that in an art class rather than in, an, in a designated computer science class. So there's a lot of potential in uh, teachers from other fields that, well, now I think there's worldwide a teacher shortage in any field but there have been lots of times where there was a teacher um, overload in, in uh, courses like French or history 
So maybe then you can try to get them to teach them computing. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, once again, amazing topic on uh, how brain works, but also all your other efforts that you shared with us. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here today. Please give Helene one more round of applause.